Good morning, everybody, and thank you for nice introduction. Uh, I'll be talking about qualitative analysis of low secondary school mathematics teachers' topic specific content knowledge in the US and Russia. I appreciate Norma highlighting the value of qualitative studies. So, this is a qualitative study. And it's a part of the larger study. Uh, I'll talk a little later. Uh, I go through research focus of the study, the frame, the methodology, talking about the instrument translation and adaptation, participants' data collection analysis, findings, and discussion. Um, I'm afraid that in a short uh, 15 minutes, uh, I'll probably be skipping some of the slides to get to the findings sooner. Uh, what is the research focus of this study? Cross-national studies allow understanding on how teacher uh, teacher education is contextualized in different countries, which requires a range of analytic methods that draw out conflicting views, contested areas, and shared beliefs. Um, I met Jerry, and I think his view on the value of qualitative study is well captured here. In the last decade, a number of studies on teacher education were focusing on unpacking culturally contextualized and semantically decontextualized dimensions in order to create a more balanced comparative perspective. However, few comparative studies address in-service teachers' content knowledge. Saying in-service teachers' content knowledge. There is a huge study done by my colleague from uh, Arizona State University, Maria Teresa Tato. She did uh, a study on pre-service teachers' content knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge in 17 countries, but very few studies are conducted at the level of in-service teachers. Um, moreover, the field lacks research that provides an in-depth analysis of teacher knowledge at a topic-specific level. Again, Norma was talking about algebraic thinking and geometric thinking, and teachers do prefer certain subject areas or domains within the discipline. When you zoom in into the topic specific, you can highlight some of the details and nuances in teacher knowledge. The study focused on the following research question. To what extent is the US and Russian low secondary mathematics teachers content knowledge similar and or different in the topic specific context? Uh, the theoretical framework is mostly based on the ideas of Schumann, and uh, uh, most of you uh, know the work of Schumann at 1986-87, uh, and since then the field was benefiting from the development of that framework through the uh, frames of Michigan um, uh, University, mathematical knowledge for teaching. There are some frames uh, developed in Europe, the Knowledge Quartet, um, the uh, Mathematics for Teaching, Brent Davis from Canada. Uh, we've done our contribution to the field by publishing in Educational Studies in Mathematics in 2011, the frame on cognitive types of teaching knowledge. Uh, I'll skip this one, methodology. So we used the instrument that again was uh, tested and validated in 2011. Uh, we did translate that instrument. Uh, it's a teacher content knowledge survey. Um, we employed multi-level translation procedure using an expertise of the Russian-speaking members of the research team to ensure linguistic equivalence of the adapted survey items with two rounds of independent translation followed by the round of reconciliation. The survey consisted of 33 multiple choice items, but the pool was about 280 items, and the 33 items were selected from that pool. Uh, addressing main topics of low secondary mathematics curriculum, as well as different cognitive types of content knowledge, uh, namely facts and procedures, concepts and connections, models and generalizations. Specification table along with the item analysis was performed to ensure the content and construct validity of the instrument, along with its reliability at the level of Kronbach-Alpha 0.89. Uh, 
So the participants for this qualitative study were selected using non-probability purposive sampling um, to get participants specifically uh, selected the US and Russian teachers uh, that represent different quartiles in the total scores of the uh, instrument measure. And selected teachers teach at similar school settings, urban public schools. The instrument initially was administered to the initial uh, to the sample of uh, uh, six and nine grade teachers in the US. Uh, 102 teachers were tested in the US and 97 teachers were tested in Russia, the grades five, nine. The sample from both countries was subdivided by quartiles using teachers' overall scores and selected teachers, uh, pseudonyms along with their total scores and the quartiles that they belong to presented in the table. Eight teachers from each country. Two teachers from each quartile and uh, you see the scores of those teachers uh, the total score on the, on the instrument. So then what happened, we used this uh, sample, eight teachers from each country, and we interviewed them. We selected items that specifically target the topic on fraction division. Uh, and we used five questions that you see on the screen. The first question, when you teach fraction division, what are important terms, facts, procedures, concepts, and reasoning strategies you should, your students should know or should learn? Question number two, what is the fraction division rule? Three, apply the rule to the following fraction division problem. Four, construct a word problem for the given fraction division. And five, is the following statement, as you see, the statement is conflicting, ever true? So the idea was to touch upon the pedagogical content knowledge with a question one and then go through those different cognitive types of knowledge, asking questions on the level of facts and procedures, on the level of connection, the question four, and on the level of reasoning, question five. Uh, that analysis, uh, and here's the point where I would like to thank uh, um, blind reviewers of our proposal, because initially, taking into account the categorical nature of the quantitative data, we were using frequency counts. Uh, we planned to use a non-parametric chi-square uh, chi technique. And considering a small sample size, we intended to employ Yiddish correction for contingency tables uh, for expected frequencies less than five. But then we got response from reviewers suggesting kindly to reconsider the use of the chi-square for the small sample size, and we will be reporting frequencies only. In order to analyze quali qualitative data, we conducted meaning coding and linguistic analysis of the teacher interview narratives as a primary method of analysis. To increase the credibility of the qualitative analysis, the meaning coding and linguistic analysis were performed and cross-checked by two independent raters. Here are the findings. Uh, we selected the interpretive cross-case study design, Miriam, to examine uh, the teacher's topic-specific knowledge of one of the important themes in low secondary mathematics curriculum in both countries, division of fractions. The data analysis clearly demonstrated that the participants had similarities and differences while responding to the interview questions, but in some questions we would see uh, the differences that uh, I would like to highlight. Teacher response to question one, the pedagogical content knowledge question. Um, we coded uh, teacher responses to the question one using the following categories. Vocabulary, facts and procedures, concepts and connections, and reasoning. And as you would see, the vocabulary, as uh, you see, the, uh, the frequency of terms used in the interview related to vac uh, vocabulary in uh, both cases were pretty similar. The facts and procedures 
not much difference. Concepts and connections pretty close. But the main difference that we observed was in the category of reasoning. The most frequently used category in response to question one was vocabulary, with no uh, significant difference. Still see the language of the chai school is still there, but uh, I'm, I'm saying no difference. Uh, uh, with regard to categories, facts and procedures, and concepts and connections, we also didn't detect uh, differences. And the only category uh, where we detected, observed the significance uh, was the category of category of reasoning. The second question, a frequency of terms used by the US and Russian teachers while explaining the rule for fraction division. This is an insightful table uh, because of a couple of observations. Look at the flip. That's what uh, US teachers use when they describe the fraction division. The seven out of eight used that term. And only one Russian teacher used the term flip. But also you could see that uh, terms such as reciprocal, dividend and divisor, first fraction, second fraction, mainly used by the US teachers, where the dividend, dividend and divisor were, uh, were used by Russian teachers. We'll get to a slide with some discussion on this later. Uh, the question three was not insightful, so everybody was able to solve the problem of given fraction division correctly. Um, most of the teachers in both groups silently performed the division on the scratch paper that was provided to every participant during the interview. All participating teachers correctly solved the given fraction division problem. Slight differences were observed in the representation of the response. One of the US teachers illustrated the division by a uh, pictorial model. Question number four, which uh, meant to tap into the understanding of the fraction division. There are several distinct meaning of the fraction, uh, division of fractions discussed by scholars. Uh, Lipping uh, Ma, for example, claimed that there are three main models and corresponding meanings to represent the division of fractions measurement, partitive, and product and factors. And the question four was challenging to both US and Russian participants. Um, uh, only five US teachers were able to construct a correct word, word problem compared to eight Russian teachers. Very similar observation that goes back to Liping Ma observation between the US and Chinese teachers. Um, and the table shows the distribution of the use of meaning of the fraction division. Uh, the US teachers mostly use the measurement quantitative model, where the Russian teachers uh, use the part to whole and rectangular model uh, more frequently. The other observation was that uh, among the US teachers, three teachers uh, were presenting incorrect response to, to the problem where uh, all Russian teachers were able to construct correct word problem for the fraction division. And the finding for question five. This, uh, this question was challenging, again, by the nature of the statement. It was controversial uh, to both US and Russian teachers, as depicted in the table we were not able to observe any significant differences between groups in a number of correct responses, uh, only one correct and one partially correct solution proposed by the US teachers compared to three correct and one partially correct solution provided by Russian teachers. But what we were observing in case of US teachers, four teachers tried to plug in numbers to see if the statement is true. None of the Russian teachers tried to do that. All right, so let's do a little discussion on a couple of observations. The teacher articulation of the learning objectives. Most insightful finding in teacher responses to question one was the fact that both US and Russian teachers quite similarly define learning objectives for the division of fraction. Both groups 
clearly outlined the main vocabulary students should learn, facts and procedures students should master and concepts students should understand. The revealing difference was observed in teacher response to the reasoning category. Despite the fact that the question was explicitly asked to articulate what are the important reasoning strategies students should know, none of the year's teachers responded to this part of the question. So they skipped that part. Um, whereas six Russian teachers who highlighted the importance of the development of logical reasoning for teachers, as well as checking for reasonableness to teachers. And I would appreciate any comments from the uh, audience. Uh, uh, is there any practicing teachers in the group? Teachers? Nobody? Um, this finding may suggest that US teachers do not see a reasoning potential in the topic of the division of fractions, whereas the, their Russian counterparts emphasize the development of students' critical thinking as one of the important learning objectives for the topic of fraction division. Uh, teachers' use of mathematical uh, vocabulary, I think we uh, already briefly highlighted the main differences. Uh, I would like to just go back and look at the use of certain terms. Most frequently used term among the U.S. teachers was division, six frequency counts, whereas reciprocal, seven counts, and multiplicative universe, six counts were the most frequently used terms by Russian teachers. Um, what this result might suggest is that the U.S. teachers focused on the operation in general uh, division, whereas Russian teachers uh, seems to emphasize the operation specific to the division of fractions, reciprocal, multiplicative, inverse. Next observation is concerned with the use of accurate mathematical terminology, dividend and versus first fraction and divisor versus second fraction. You would say, what a big difference. What is the big deal here? But I think accuracy in terminology does tell uh, some priorities that are placed in teacher training as well as the teacher professional development uh, in, 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 the, in uh, uh, both countries. Our observation also revealed a strong tendency on the part of the US teachers to use the term flip as a sub-language for reciprocal and multiplicative inverse. Um, the uh, informal communication with teachers uh, on this particular issue uh, revealed uh, the intention of the US teachers to help students to understand. But at the end, this is not the accurate way to um, describe the, uh, the operation. Teacher understanding of the meaning of the division of fractions, we found that the measurement model was the most popular model, five frequency counts, and the only model used by the US teachers in response to that question. In contrast, Russian teachers applied uh, three different models for the fraction division, with the rectangular area model being the most frequently used. Uh, teacher reasoning in the uh, fraction division context. Analysis of teacher narratives to question five did not show strong difference between the groups in a number of correct responses, whereas the U.S. teachers proposed only one correct, C is equal to D, and one partially correct solution, A is equal to B and equal to C and D. The Russian counterparts... Thank you provided three correct and one partially correct solution. A strong difference was reported with regard to a method of proof used by teachers. None of the Russian teachers attempted to prove the statement numerically. Uh, compared to four US teachers who tried to plug in different numbers to check the state if the statement works. Synthesizing the main findings of the study, we report that the topic-specific level of analysis help us to unpack hidden insights in terms of differences and similarities in teacher knowledge. Uh, considering the qualitative nature of the study, we're cognizant of its limitations, and congruently, we're sensitive, do not overgeneralize the, uh, the findings of the study. The granularized methodology used in the study to unpack and analyze teachers' topic-specific knowledge could be considered as a potential contribution to the field of cross-national studies on teacher knowledge. 
um, there is one important comment on this uh, line of conclusion that um, the studies on teaching knowledge are moving from the static measure of teacher knowledge to measuring teacher knowledge in the process, which, is, uh, which brings another layer of complication to, to the study. The study suggests close comparison and learning about issues related to teacher knowledge in the US and Russia with a potential focus on re-examining practices in teacher preparation and professional development. Thank you. Okay, uh, good afternoon. Uh, thank you very much for the introduction and for the invitation to give a talk here. Uh, I, as it says over there, um, I was born in Russia and I work and live in Canada, so I'm sort of half and half, and it's always a very exciting time to come back to the place where I was born, and it's especially uh, great to be able to present here. Uh, and I'm wearing only one ear ring because I've been told that it's going to be interfering <laughs> with the metal, so I'm not a hippie. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'm going to switch gears a little bit uh, from uh, the focus, a very nice presentation, uh, from the focus on uh, um, research and mathematics education, uh, basically to mathematics education, because my main occupation is a teacher at the university level and also a teacher educator. So we'll start with the problematic of mathematics education itself. Uh, I'm referring to the beautiful Venn diagram shown in enormous <laughs> uh, presentation. So I'm looking at this uh, subcase. Anyhow, we'll start with this question. We will continue with problem solving. So I want you uh, to look at it and hear yourself saying, what is your answer to this question? Uh, don't uh, don't tell me. It's a simple square root of four. Just uh, think about it. What is your first uh, reaction to this question? Okay. You can also think what would be your student's reaction to this question if you already thought about your reaction. And so we'll go to the next slide. And there is a multiple choice quiz, right? There, is a mul there, are, there are options. So this square root symbol of four is equal to. It's option number one. Who thinks uh, that this is the answer? OK, some people. Uh, there is option number two, square root of four, plus or minus. OK. And there is option number three, uh, either is good as long as the reasoning is provided, as long there's a... Okay, so some, some people, I think, chose one of the two options and then switched to the third option. <laughs> okay, anyhow, so even in this audience, I guess there is a variety of opinion to this question. And we'll look at this question. Uh, we think that the concept of square root is met by students quite earlier when they start talking about arithmetic, right? They take uh, square roots of numbers. And then at the school algebra, again, square root appears. And then when we study functions as a part of calculus, square root function appears and then square root as a part of complex numbers and complex analysis. So it might look like that there is some transposition of this notion, perhaps didactic transposition, which people who do anthropology, they think that there is a transposition from research to teaching. When we bring some notion from research field to the teaching field, they change their meaning, they might change their meaning. 
or it's the, from one topic to another, there might be some change, right? So this, the, it, it may look like, so here is a quotation, so let me read it. The concept of square root lacks a consensual approach in the mathematical community. Even here we have a variety of opinions. Therefore, we should consider and reconsider such labels as this is erroneous, this is an error, and we should collect, uh, refer to students, uh, yeah, so we should switch from correct and incorrect and just allow various answers and bring various opinions in the, in the community, right? So I'm referring to uh, Igor Kantorovich, his recent paper in uh, uh, 20, uh, 2018, when he expressed this opinion. And Igor is, a, I know him, I met him at conferences, nice young fellow uh, working in New Zealand. And I actually, I said, it's great what you are doing because what, whatever, whatever, opinion from the students or from the teacher students he has collected and presented, it actually mimics my own uh, experience. When I talk to my students or future teachers, it's also a variety of opinion across the board. Like you never have a homogeneity when you ask those questions. So I said to him, it's great because you are collecting this evidence that there is a disagreement, but I'm completely upset about those conclusions. And in particular, I'm thinking of what is the mathematical community we are referring here. And again, I wish I had this slide from you. So <laughs> if we are referring to that red square in the middle, that's what I want uh, to refer to. If this is the mathematical community, or it's a wider community of uh, pure researchers and pure mathematics and mathematics educators and researchers and students and teachers, everyone, right? So maybe we, when we consider the entire community, uh, there is a variety of opinion. But I would like to focus on this red uh, circle of the, the mathematical community of professionals, right? And I'm thinking that this mathematics community has a responsibility to sort of bring the clarity into this and to settle this, this discussion. So my position is that uh, the mathematical community that uptakes a theoretical base of modern technology does have a consensus on the matter, as consistency is one of the principles of science. Because I don't want to fly a plane where one part is built based on square root of four being two, and the other part was made based on square root of four being minus two, and then the two parts may not work together because the two engineers had a different concepts, like, like just the idea of safety, right? So, so I think the mathematical community, it's, it's our, I'm referring to myself as a part of this community as being a mathematician, not as a teacher, but as a teacher as well. So, and by the way, if you check the reference, there is a difference between a square root and z square root. And a square root refers to two numbers, z square root refers to one number, and the symbol square root refers to one number. Okay. Uh, I think in the Russian context, there is a because some languages, including the Russian language, we don't have A and Z. So how to, how, to, how to tell the difference? There is a notion of arithmetic root, as far as I understand, an algebraic root. So there are some nuances where you assign uh, single meaning or, or double meaning. But at the same time, 
So, so there must be some consensus, and we have to protect this consensus just for the safety purposes. That's, that's the opinion. But on the other hand, I'm against of saying this is right and this is wrong, and just to punish the student because he had his own way of reasoning and he came to this idea by his or her own way, uh, it will just, I, I guess, will stop the conversation, then such a student will get an idea that these mathematicians always have those, you know, uh, barriers and they always create uh, something new and uh, I don't want to, uh, I, 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 I don't know anymore what's going on. But anyhow, so what we did, and that's coming to my, to my research uh, project, which I described very briefly because I wanted to focus on the issue. Right, I can give details of this project uh, if somebody is interested. But roughly speaking, I was working with uh, 60 students uh, in a Canadian university who are uh, pre-service secondary teachers. This is the group with whom I often work. And when I asked them the three options, uh, the majority of them, 40 of them, they choose option two or option three. Okay, and so I didn't tell them at that point that you're right and you're wrong, you, you didn't do your homework or something. This, this, this doesn't work, especially with teachers, especially with teachers. They're very, they're my heroes, but, but they're very gentle in the sense of when you point out on what's right or wrong. But I thought I will let them to decide and let them to convince each other. So I was interested uh, what argument they would bring in the defense of their positions. And I'm uh, uh, showing here the arguments, the teachers who thought option one, and I think it's option, I, I think we should, we should, the whole point of this talk is that it is option one for me. Uh, so, so I asked those teachers to, and using paradoxes is also one of my interests in, in education, so, Paradoxes are pretty convincing things. Um, so I ask them to bring and to show others what contradictions or what paradoxes will emerge from the position number two. And in this talk, I'm going to just a couple of more slides uh, to show you examples to show you examples of what teachers themselves brought to defend position number one. Okay, so number one was the winner, was the absolutely convincing argument. If I press on my calculator, square root followed by a number, the calculator gives me only two. It gives me just one answer. My calculator never gives me two answers, right? And they trust their calculator. And I thought this is a conference on technology, so that's, that's my... That's so much as I can talk about relevance of technology to this talk, but this is a, this is a huge relevance. I found that uh, students believe their calculator, right? That there was no objection to that. Like, that, that convinced almost the whole group after that, right? So, but other arguments are also interesting. For example, one teacher brought up uh, in the quadratic formula, you know, we say minus b plus or minus square root of discriminant. If, if the square root had two values, why would we put plus or minus in front of the square root? And that was also quite, I mean, it wouldn't change anything if there are two values, but it would be redundant. That would be a little bit redundant to say plus or minus in parentheses minus plus two, right? Or something like that. So, uh, so that was argument number two. Uh, but I thought those are more on, on a surface, but there were some deep, uh, interesting arguments too. Uh, for example, uh, we all always thought, uh, we always tell students and teachers, once you solve the problem, check the answer. 
substitute your, your solution back. So if the equation would look like radical on the left-hand side and a variable on the right-hand side, in this particular case, uh, square root of 3 plus 2x equals minus x, you can think about what the solution is. Uh, but suppose you found the solution and you start to substitute it back and then you got a problem because the left-hand side would have two values and the right-hand side would have one value. So how you can tell that, that how two values could be equal one value, so there is some paradoxical uh, implication in this case. And I hope, uh, do I have a couple of minutes more? Yeah, so, so the last one, number four, is my favorite. It's my, I mean, maybe because I... And this is also brought, brought up by students. None of those I invented. Mm, uh, uh, you know how we say in calculus that if, if you study a limit, then if the limit, say, from the left is not equal to the limit to the right, then the function is it has a jump discontinuity and the limit does not exist. So the student brought up this example, that if we start to evaluate square root of 4 minus x at x equals 0, so you substitute 0, you get square root of 4, and according to the second option, square root of 4 is plus 2 and minus 2. Therefore, the limit does not exist. Yeah, the, the, no, but assume that the symbol square root has two values. That's, that was their logic. And that is a not, not a function. No, 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 I mean, it's, it's a sort of a humoristic judgment, but like, because in calculus we do those examples, evaluate the limit of square root, blah, blah. So he, he substituted the value x and he got square root, but according to option two it has two values, and he made, it's a leap, of course, it's, it's, it's a funny answer, but, but he judged in this particular case that the limit does not exist, and then he looked at the graph on the calculator, and there is no discontinuity, so he said that there is a disagreement. So it's, it's funny how they play with those, but, but in the end, uh, many people found themselves that there, it is problematic to have to assign to the square root two values. And I thought it was revealing by students. Number one, uh, I hope, all of them now think that square root of 4 is 2. But, but more importantly, they got this pedagogical idea of bringing the, the questionable value to bring it into discussion among the group and to decide within the group like what, what we are going to do, right? So, so my conclusion yeah, so then after this, I don't have much statistics, but um, it was only 60 people, but the majority of them, 90% of them, thought it was, it was beneficial for their knowledge, for their teaching practices. This discussion was beneficial to them, and they didn't object to the, to the word erroneous. They would have objected if it was on the test and I would mark it and then they would receive a bad grade, etc. So, but, but within the discussion, it wasn't pointing on them directly, but it was pointing on the concept. So I think it also builds up their pedagogical tools. Uh, but anyhow, so... Uh, and the con my conclusion would be that when we talk about mathematics and mathematical knowledge, number one, we should pay attention to the detail, like a root versus z root. Like when we formulate our conjecture, we should think about assumptions, we should think where we are, right? And then I'm thinking that um, the results of this survey say, clearly that practices of telling tricks or telling right or wrong 
they're not good, but also living this with students, living this entirely up to students to decide that, that my idea is that or that. We are here like mathematicians and teachers of mathematics. We are there to defend the values of, of the mathematical community just to keep up the standards just for our own safety for the future with technology. But uh, so this is my conclusion, but uh, I'm open uh, to, uh, I'm an easy person, so I'm open to, <laughs> to hear your, I usually hear uh, uh, your, uh, like, uh, the comments. So thank you very much for, for your attention. Thank you very much to both the speaker. Now I would like to invite them here in order to pose some questions. Is anybody uh, ready to ask the first question? We had uh, the teacher content knowledge uh, from the first speaker uh, related to a cross-national study uh, on uh, the use of uh, fraction, division by fraction, and uh, we have uh, the square root of two. Square root of four. Of four, square root of four, sorry. <laughs> uh, but uh, I thought uh, we, uh, would, uh, we uh, will have a conversation uh, there. <laughs> uh, my uh, question about square root, uh, is the uh, following. Mm, the graph of uh, square root uh, has two versions. Yes. If uh, you determine the square root uh, in your uh, B valued uh, sense, uh, so uh, this graph is a parabola uh, on uh, its side. Uh, parabola with horizontal axis. So uh, no, no contradiction uh, between uh, <laughs> limit and uh, between, uh, yes, existing and uh, not existing limit. Uh, every uh, mean, meaning is uh, twice and limit we have only in uh, vertices of parabola. Uh, and uh, this is uh, not a uh, question, but remark uh, showing uh, the question. Uh, details in mathematics are very important, but uh, there are two mathematics, uh, two mathematicists, <laughs> I think. Uh, uh, an axiomatic theory uh, we uh, used to uh, teach, or especially uh, in uh, high school or and uh, low um, and first uh, grades in universities, uh, we used to teach axiomatic theories. Uh, no contradictions. Uh, details, yes a lot of details and no contradictions. If you prefer to teach contradictions, to teach uh, real mathematics, uh, nobody knows what is real mathematics, of course, but everybody believes there are contradictions. Uh, we uh, have to determine what uh, ages, uh, what uh, levels of uh, ages uh, can we regard as our uh, pedagogic goal, I think. Thank you okay. very much. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I guess to the first uh, question, um, I mean, we can have a discussion later, but roughly uh, when you inverse a function, obviously uh, you don't put just parabola on its side, you just define function, which is a one-to-one -one correspondence, and then you inverse it, right? And then you pick, and, and if you... Graph of square root, uh, if you have the second uh, conception, is not a graph of function. 
Yes, it's not uh, a graph of function, and we pick in uh, complex we have, analysis. We have graph, we have we have principal of branch of it. Uh, circle. We have graph. Uh, I'm sorry, but uh, we uh, need uh, the uh, time uh, also for Adara. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. It's nice uh, to no. have debate. Yeah, we yeah. we will have it. Will we will We can discuss this, but uh, yeah. Thank you. Other questions? Uh, thank you very much for the uh, presenters. Um, this question to the uh, comparative studies. Um, can you um, go back to the slides because th there was an um, incorrect response um, but I found. Uh, is it possible to see the slide? Incorrect, uh, incorrect response, responses uh, of both the teachers. Is it possible to see the slide again? If I remember correctly, there was um, uh, zero response. Oh uh, yeah, there was uh, in the fraction division. There was one uh, when they did respond to question three. Uh, yes. Um, On the one hand, yeah, reasoning. On the one hand, um, I think this one, right? Incorrect responses. Uh, You're talking about this? Uh, the, the previous previous one. It, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, on the one hand, it is um, it, we cannot expect the uh, the the practicing or the in in service teachers to be uh, mathematic experts. Um, on the other hand, it's alarming that um, what kind, the quality of teaching um, uh, the students uh, would be receiving at the other end with these teachers. There are a lot of studies in Australia and also in England. Uh, they show that the uh, in-service teachers, they, uh, they do not have uh, sufficient mathematic knowledge to teach. Uh, it's quite alarming. Um, uh, and not only that, they do not have uh, 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 sufficient knowledge about the typical errors and misconce misconceptions. Um, the, is, the question to you is, your comparative study focused on this area, for example, uh, 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 highlighted uh, misconce misconceptions or typical errors in, in a division or fraction? You didn't focus about that. No, the the focus of the study was not on misconceptions. So we just selected those um, uh, subset of those teachers from a larger study because uh, there is uh, in the literature there is a critique toward using surveys that uh, has multiple choice format, and uh, I think the most prominent critique comes from Alan Schoenfeld. Um, so we decided to look, to zoom in into certain items. And the, the, the question three, four, five, they were in the survey. So when we selected the subgroup of teachers, we thought that uh, getting the qualitative data from interviewing them would help us to see those nuances in teacher responses. We did not have a specific focus on studying misconceptions, but we just observed, collected, and reported data. How do they respond to those specific questions that were selected by the team to provide for the interview? Uh, there was another piece of, uh, in your question, um, uh, Teacher knowledge at the end matters because of the student achievement, right? So um, uh, the field is um, benefiting from uh, some studies done elsewhere in the in, in the world, and I think uh, I've um, mentioned, but we went through the slide pretty quickly. A um, uh, coactive project in Germany was trying to connect the teacher content knowledge, pedagogical content, and st student achievement, right? Yeah. Uh, our initial study in 2011 was also based on the relationship between teacher content knowledge, teaching practice, mm -hmm. 
and the student achievement. That was a very complicated project to pull out uh, because you bring in the teaching practice into the consideration, and that's a complex factor in the analysis. But uh, the field is moving toward getting the teacher knowledge examined in the process. I hope I, I responded to your question. Yeah. I just want to ask about the same slide. When some of the American teachers were saying it was a flip, do you think that they were using that as a metaphor? Do you have any indication whether they also had the knowledge of the terms reciprocal, dividend, divisor, and so on? Was it that they lacked the knowledge of the proper mathematical terms, or were they just using a metaphor for the students? That's a good question. I think uh, teachers, uh, th this term is commonly used by teachers and students, and uh, most likely that the students pick up the teacher language. Uh, I am okay with metaphors as soon as they do not become a dead end. Uh, let me give you another example. Um, uh, in the U.S., uh, when you do sub 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 subtraction, teachers use a metaphor of borrowing, which is not an accurate term, and it, it's not highlighting the operation correctly. So you're borrowing, and if you use the metaphor of borrowing, what do we do you, when you borrow? You have to return it back, right? But when you do the operation of subtraction, you're not borrowing because you're not giving it back. What you're doing is regrouping, right? So there's a, that fine line on using metaphors as a dead end or a metaphor that would help students to see the meaning of the operation. And you can extend that to connect to another procedures later on. If that doesn't happen, then I would say, that metaphor probably is not the best one. Thank you Other for the question. Other questions? No. Maybe we can, okay. We can close some observation. I, I, first of all, I want to thank both the speakers for these really engaging and inter interesting topics. And uh, the first topic is interesting because it highlighted these differences. What, what is intriguing is which kind of cultural and institutional reasons uh, could be at uh, the basis of these differences. Another point uh, has been highlighted, the process, uh, to observe the teachers uh, in a process, not only in a static way. And uh, one intriguing aspect, uh, you quoted that, uh, the intersection between uh, teacher content knowledge and pedagogical content knowledge uh, that are absolutely related. About the square root of four, we can discuss uh, a lot uh, because, uh, you know, it is absolutely challenging. Uh, if you want uh, to see a meme, one of the memes presented by uh, Julia the first day of this Congress, we have also a meme on the square root of four. Thank you so much, indeed, you. for your presence here. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.